Uh, first of all, thanks everybody so much for joining us. There's people signed up from everywhere from California to Mike in New York. Carly's actually in, in Grand Cayman today. Uh, and people all over the world from Europe to, to Asia. And so whatever time of day it is, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and I hope that we can share something of, of value to you today. Um, just off the top, just uh, to say that nothing being said today is investment advice. It's not sufficient information to make any investments and nobody here is representing uh, that other Carly or Mike or Broadridge, any interest or promotion of two prime, uh, no, I promote Carly, I think she's great. And I, I think Broadridge is great, but you need to make your own uh, independent investment decisions. And today is for informational purposes only. Uh, in terms of our webinar for today, what we're gonna go over is a quick introduction, which we're in the midst of right now. I'll tell you a tiny bit about Two Prime. Uh, then we're gonna speak with Carly about her interest in crypto and as well as a little bit of what she's up to and then take a couple minutes to have a few questions from the audience for Carly. You'll notice uh, if you're a viewer of this webinar, uh, there'll be in your chat box the ability to ask questions. So feel free throughout the webinar to offer your questions and we will uh, answer them both after I ask a couple questions to Carly. And at the end, there'll be questions for both Mike and Carly. Um, after we hear from Carly, we're going to talk with Michael Tay about uh, the chief, now the chief transformation officer at Broadridge about how Broadridge is seeing institutions use blockchain as a technology solution and where the market's going as well as what Broadridge is focused on in this realm. Uh, after that, I'm gonna talk a bit more about specifically Bitcoin and Ethereum and the relationship to institutions during this current bull cycle. And then we'll take about 10 minutes of questions at the end and we will end no longer than an hour uh, from the start of this thing so you can get on with your day and so I can get on with mine. So um, with that being said, let's just a brief introduction. I'm Alex, the, the managing director of Two Prime. Two Prime offers a structured investment product for uh, exposure to digital assets. We do a combination of options trading and lending in order to offer risk managed exposure uh, to the crypto market for high net worth individuals, family offices, uh, corporate treasuries, um, and institutions as well. So uh, very excited to be speaking with you. I've been in the crypto market since 2013 and, and you know beyond, it's nice to make money, but just passionate about the way that crypto and blockchain intersects across society, politics, economics, and it, I believe it is going to inform our futures in a very big way. And I just find it immensely rewarding to have the opportunity to work in a space that's so exciting, fast moving and full of so many innovative and, and interesting people. Um, Carly, who is joining us today is one of the stars of Mr. Robot, a show about hacking and cryptocurrency that also happened to have Rami Malek as like a backup actor to Carly um, and has worked on Suburgatory and also happens to be the best cousin in the world to me. Um, Carly also, you, she can tell you a bit more about it, but is working on some new projects as well. Uh, and then Mike Tay, who, when we started the, promoting this webinar last month, was the head of strategy or chief strategy officer at Broadridge, now is the chief transformation officer. So if you wanted to see the chief strategy officer, you can, you can sign off now. But we have the chief transformation officer, Mike, who also is on the advisory board for the Federal Reserve of New York and also used to be the executive vice president at MicroStrategy, which is aggressively buying Bitcoin at taking out 0% loans from their in investors, which is very interesting to me. Um, so we can hear from Mike as well today is gonna talk about institutional use of blockchain as a technology. Um, so with that being said, um, just really quickly to prime, you know, our approach is that whether you like it or not, cryptocurrency and digital assets are here to stay and they're going to inform your investment and your portfolio uh, and you can either take an intelligent approach to that and uh, take advantage of it. We still think it's very early on in those days, or you can wait and, and fall behind and then uh, wait for you know gold to be replaced by Bitcoin, for example, and try to catch up. And so for us, we try to be a trusted partner to our small group of clients uh, to navigate these waters successfully. So with that promotion aside, uh, let's turn it over to Carly. So Carly, hi, how are you doing today? I'm good, how are you? I want to apologize if my internet 
is bad. I'm in the Cayman Islands and my hotel connected through my phone. All good. What, what are you doing down in the Cayman Islands? I am here to shoot a movie. Um, there's zero COVID here, which is amazing, but that means we have to quarantine for two weeks before we do anything. So I can't set foot out of my hotel room for literally two weeks. Oh my gosh. Well, I think I would lose my mind if that was me. Yeah, I'm trying not to. It's like day two. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so I have a long way to go. Then you'll have like a beard and like be pulling your hair out. Yeah. Um, so you know, I have these questions here and, and you know, we don't have to follow them exactly, but you know, obviously I think a lot of people know you through acting on, on Mr. Robot. And obviously that show had a uh, discussion of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And so I wonder how that, you know, that work on that show affected your relationship to crypto or how you learned about it or any other kind of insights you gained from the show. Well, I mean, it definitely opened my eyes to the whole tech world in general and the hacking world. Um, and cryptocurrency because we had eCoin. And, you know, in the last season, eCoin kind of was in, took over everything. And then I actually ended up hacking the whole system and taking money from everyone. So that is my uh, <laughs> understanding or my experience with cryptocurrency is being able to hack it all, um, <laughs> which, I don't know how many Darlene's there are out there in the real world, but, um, but my, you know, one of my friends who I think is watching right now has been a big advocate of Bitcoin for a very long time. And from the beginning was, has always been very <laughs> stands behind it. Um, but so he's also opened my eyes up to this world and it is a very interesting, crazy place. So within like the world of crypto, I know, uh, you know, there's obviously like Bitcoin, there's all these new DeFi protocols for kind of finance on a blockchain. And then there are NFTs. Is any of that in particular, you know, a specific interest to you? Yeah. So NFTs really are something that has, was also just recently brought to my attention by my same friend. Um, because I am an artist, like number three says. Um, and so what's, it's incredible because it's just like another way and another platform to share your art into a whole other different community. So that's something I've been really interested, to, interested in and looking into and have kind of started plotting my first NFT to come. So everybody stay tuned. Oh man, I know like there's, I think it's complicated with NFTs because I know I know you mostly do uh, like painting, physical paintings, and it seems to be like NFTs do a lot of digital stuff, or there's you know moving images, music, all sorts of stuff. Um, in terms of I don't know, I don't want to give too much away, but in terms of what you're plotting as you know traditional more paint based artist, how does that connect with NFTs, or has that been a, a challenge in any way? That's been kind of the biggest challenge, I think. It's hard because digital art versus real painting in life, like you can have one image digitally and paint the same thing and they look completely different and feel completely different. Um, for me, I kind of am doing or want to do something that combines like my physical painting with technology in a way. Um, and so kind of melding the two and having there be some hidden stuff in those paintings for when I upload it. Super cool, wow. Yeah. Um, Just awesome. came up with this, but I'm very, wow. very excited. <laughs> um, I know also separate from the, the film you're shooting down in the Cayman Islands that you just announced that you're both acting in, executive producing, and have written a new television show. Um, I don't know if there's anything you could share about that or what that's about, but um, Super impressive. Yeah, it's about cryptocurrency. Okay. It's not at all. Um, yeah, I wrote a TV show that uh, Miramax picked up to develop um, with Julie Bowen as one of my executive producers and Liz Brooksius who created Nurse Jackie. I don't know if anybody has seen that as my showrunner. And it's a dark comedy. Um, 
basically about a home or two home organizers and mom and daughter whose lives are total messes. And I'm very excited. It'll be my, the first project that I've written and to Afton. That's amazing. So, okay, I'm going to turn it over and um, say, see a couple questions for you at this point. Let's see. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And um, so the question, so uh, have you, are you an investor yourself in any cryptocurrencies? I'm getting into Bitcoin. Getting into Bitcoin. Which I'm very excited about. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm like obviously kicking myself from not doing it like seven years ago, but better now than never. For sure. Um, okay, let's see what else here. Um, I guess, do you talk to a lot of tech people after being on Mr. Robot? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely opened my world to that and I think has opened a lot of the tech world to me. Um, while I was on the show, we had a lot of tech consultants and so I always hounded them and asked them a million questions about everything and had them show me and tell me everything that they know. But, you know, and I've been able to go to different tech conferences and speak at them. So it's really opened my world to that world. Awesome. Uh, there's a couple more questions here, but just to keep it on schedule, I'm going to turn it over to Mike and we can do more uh, questions at the end as well. So uh, thanks, Carly. If you have the chance to hang out, that'd be awesome. Um, but either way, thanks so much. Yeah, stick around. Cool. So next we have Mike or Michael Tay. Mike, thanks for joining us. Of course, Alex, anytime. <laughs> okay, we'll do we'll do once a week. Um, <laughs> okay, never mind. Take it back. Um, so maybe as question zero before one through five here is for those not familiar with Broadridge, maybe you could just give a kind of high level view of Broadridge, which I think is kind of like a financial conglomerate, and so maybe that'd be a helpful kind of way to start here. Yeah, I think um, the best way to describe Broadridge for the audience is um, we're a financial technology company, but. Really what we do is we, we're a financial markets inf infrastructure provider. So we are kind of in the back office and the background of the Morgan Stanleys and the Goldman Sachs's of the world, um, whether it, it relates to uh, trading, um, trading and operations, uh, whether it's related to governance and go you know, regulatory um, compliance related matters. And so you know, we're, we're providing the technology and the infrastructure um, that ensures that Wall Street can function. And, you know, as an example, we handle millions of trades a day um, involving trillions of dollars. We deliver a lot of the communications um, that go out as it relates to if you're a stockholder, if you own Apple, and you're entitled to a whole series of things like annual reports and semi-annual reports, things like that. Um, you know, we, we, we distribute a lot of those, um, those communications. And then also, you know, if you're a stockholder and you're entitled to voting, right, voting your share, um, we we handle the infrastructure that ensures that all that happens. So, um, you know, in short, you know, we provide um, you know the infrastructure for the ecosystem um, for public markets, for pu public companies, broker dealers, shareholders, regulators. We kind of bring it all together. I call it like where the where the plumbing um, that makes uh, financial markets hum. Gotcha. Awesome. And so. I know that you guys talk about the ABCDs of innovation uh, and basically are tend to be on the kind of front edge of, of emerging tech in, in terms of how institutions are. And so I'm curious for those the uh, those unfamiliar, what are the ABCDs of innovation? And I believe you just came out with a, a report as well, speaking to their relationship to some, some growing companies. Yeah, definitely. So the ABCs re relates to AI, blockchain, cloud, and digital. And um, the one thing I didn't mention about, about Broadridge is that we're a B2B company. And so all of our clients are um, large financial services companies um, in general. But yeah, so thanks for, for raising that survey because we just, um, we just surveyed a bunch of our clients and other CEOs um, that are leading some of these big, um, big organizations. 
And um, we think about it in terms of, okay, technology is clearly happening. Um, it's gonna, there's, there's a ton of disruption that's, that's occurring right now. But you know, how do you, as, uh, as a leader of, um, of an asset manager or a broker dealer, how do you kind of take that um, to your advantage? How do you kind of um, you know, take all this disruption um, that's happening as it relates to technology and make it a solution and really a competitive advantage for you? And so, um, and so when we think about AI or blockchain, cloud, or digital, a lot of that is, is really tied to um, you know, the ways in which you're using data, uh, the ways in which you're using digitization, um, the ways in which you're, you're kind of bringing it all together um, onto the cloud um, to, to create better experiences, to transform you know, operational processes, and, and really, you know, we're talking about crypto, cryptocurrencies and, and Bitcoin as an example, but, you know, we're, we're, not, um, we're not investing in that, but we are actually providing the infrastructure that allows for um, companies to trade in that, right? So, um, so how, how do you take trends like what Carly was saying around investing in, in Bitcoin and, and, uh, and how, do, how do we as, uh, as an entity make sure that our clients um, who are the big businesses, right? Um, are, are prepared for a lot of these things that are happening, a lot of the trends that are happening. And so the short of it is, um, you know, we did this study. We found that organizations are definitely investing. They're investing a ton. Cloud is kind of the biggest one. Like, you know, if you heard JP, Jamie Dimon, who's the CEO of JP Morgan, you know, three or four years ago was like, you know, I'm not going to do anything with cloud. I own my own data. And now it's like everyone's cloud all day, every day, right? So that's that's definitely um, a, a big thing that's happening um, that we found. And, you know, the reality is adoption across these four things, the ABCDs, they're just, they're increase, increasing across the board. And it's just been a huge change um, in mindset for firms as they adapt their business models, as they leverage these next gen technologies and they're driving transformation and results. Gotcha. I have a, from what you said, I have kind of a question 1.B, which is, I wonder, you know, like the rate of innovation is accelerating and typically institutions are slower moving ships than startups. And so I wonder how you see like the urgency or pace or need for innovation across some of your clients as more of an imperative than just kind of like a value add or, or is there any kind of systemic risk there? Yeah, Alex, it's a great question. And uh, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because I'm actually coming out with uh, an article in Forbes uh, within the next week or two that actually addresses that precise thing just because um, there's kind of, uh, you have two ends of the spectrum, right? You have these startup, you know, fintech companies that, you know, have real promise to disrupt the industry. And then the other side, you have these huge financial services companies that own all the plumbing, they own the, the relationships, they own um, you know, they have these big channels and they are regulated, right? And so how do you balance between these startups that have you know, much cleaner tech stacks, they have better, um, you know, solutions, um, they're, they're easier to use, better user interfaces. How do you kind of take the best of both worlds? And I think the answer is that it's somewhere in the middle. So these big organizations, yes, they're, they're definitely, you know, it's hard for them to move um, quickly and be agile. And so how do you create a partnership model? And what I'm seeing is, there's just greater partnership between the fintechs and, and the big companies. And so that's, that's kind of the middle ground of this partnership world where, um, you know, you, you might be buying them, you might be partnering them, but, um, but that's how you kind of, you know, get, get the benefits of some of the, you know, the nimble, smaller fintechs and, and uniting that with these bigger organizations that have all the customer relationships you know, they, they already have the regulations, so they have to worry about, you know, Robin Hood, as, as, as you all know, is, is in the news and is, is getting hit with, with a bunch of fines. And hey, listen, you know, Morgan Stanley or Merrill Lynch, like they don't have to deal with that because they, they know how to deal with all these big regulatory matters. And so how do you kind of com combine those two competing forces into one? And I think partnerships are the way to go. Uh, the answer is higher broad range, right? Or higher broad, broad range is exactly right. Uh, so maybe drilling down a bit more on the blockchain level. I know Broadridge has a couple of blockchain um, patents and has been involved in the space from early on. I also know your, your CMO, Deborah Well, who has been involved in crypto from, used to work at Grayscale for many years and uh, is an advocate. So I'm curious, you know, Broadridge, you know, my understanding is you guys aren't like putting Bitcoin on your balance sheet anytime soon, but are more interested in the infrastructure side. And so, 
be curious to hear where, where, where you're moving and what you've done so far in the blockchain space. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I don't I don't think, you know, for now, you know, our focus has been, we definitely think there's real promise and uh, the promise on B2B blockchain, which is where we're focused on, um, you know, everything that you read about, which is, you know, um, better, better security, creating operational efficiencies, um, you know, clearer data, you know, all, all of the, and, and sort of having digital assets on, on a ledger and all the benefits that you have um, by doing that. It's all real, right? And so we've done a whole bunch of partnerships and pilots um, with our clients to, to prove that out. So I think that the promise for blockchain is absolutely there. Now, whether it's going to be like the solution that that's the end all be all that will change the way Wall Street works, like I don't think we're anywhere close to that anytime soon. But um, and so what we're what we're seeing and what we're doing is actually a whole series of pilots, and we're kind of sprinkling, um, you know, little use cases here and there with the idea that um, we can take advantage of, of, the, of the opportunity, that we can take advantage of our, our positioning in the market, which is, you know, we're kind of at the center of the network. Um, we're kind of like the Facebook for, uh, for financial services, right, as it relates to infrastructure. So how do we take all the connections that we have and um, take the, the philosophy of blockchain, which is you, it requires networks in order for them to work, and take that together and, and really take advantage of it. So we're we're heavily active in it. Like I said, it's B2B. It's still kind of early days, but we're seeing some real wins. And uh, and I think that there's great promise. It's not going to happen today, but we're probably, you know, still several years out before we see major transformation happens happening. And we want to be the first there. That's just what, and, uh, and we think that we're well positioned to do that. I'm wondering if you're able to say, are there any specific pilots or use cases that are of particular interest you can speak to? Yeah, I mean, this is this is a bit wonky, so I'm going to try to keep it as high level as possible. But just you know, one one thing that we're working on is just think about it as you have. Um, so there's bilateral repos, um, and so, sorry, they're, they're repos that big, large multinational banks have, right? And so you might have some in. New York, you might have some in Tokyo, you might, you might have some in Paris. And the way that it works right now is, um, you know, that asset is actually held at a custodian. And so, and so what happens is, you know, it just kind of sits there on the balance sheet, um, unused, and, um, and it doesn't really move anywhere, right? It just kind of sits, the one in New York sits in New York, the one in Paris sits in New York, Paris, and the ones in Tokyo sits in Paris. Now, uh, what you can do, because if you create a digital asset for that piece of collateral for that loan, what you, can, what you can now do is you can actually take that piece of collateral and as, this, as the world turns, right? So, you know, when you stop using that, that collateral in New York and then you want to use it in Japan, um, then you can now, because it's a digital asset, that asset is actually immobilized and you can take the representation of that loan and loan it out as, you know, as, as uh, the world um, continues to turn and it's not you know, while everyone is sleeping in New York, you can be using it in Tokyo. When people are sleeping in Tokyo, you can use it in, 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 in Paris. And so that's kind of the idea is um, as, as an example. I, and I, I try to really condense it, but that's one of the things that we're doing, which is really cool. And a lot of banks are really excited about it, right? Because you're freeing up capital and you're using digital, digital assets as a way to do that. Maybe you can kind of reduce overnight borrowing by using your own capital more efficiently or just borrow more efficiently? Uh -huh. It's both, right? So you're definitely, um, so you're definitely reducing capital, your capital costs, and also you're increasing your efficiencies because you're actually wasting a ton of money by having to move the asset from one entity to, and this is all within the company, right? This is all within one company, but you have different legal entities, which is why it's a pain in the ass. But um, but so you're actually saving on all these operational costs because you're actually not moving anything, but you're able to lend against it, even though it's moving, it's staying in the exact same place because of blockchain and because it is a digitized asset. Right. So it's almost putting like a connective layer on a global entity in a way that's a bit more liquid or fluid than, than previous. A hundred percent. Yeah. That's awesome. I think much to the like uh, schadenfreude of a lot of blockchain people, the Fed wire system was not working or not operational yesterday. And everyone was saying, you know, blo blockchain never goes down, Bitcoin never goes down. And uh, that's a rare occurrence, but also speaks to kind of different ages of, of infrastructure and, and different challenges like you're, you're speaking to. Um, exactly. Then I know, are you guys 
Oh, well, so the other thing I was gonna ask you from what you said to not, to not use these questions was you were talking about, you know, this, and you are the transformation officer of this move from, you know, traditional databases and traditional financial system, legacy systems over to blockchain. And there's obviously, you know, and we're probably at the front end of that movement of some databases and some functions. And I guess I'm curious to hear like, you know, what's hard, it's easy to be in a steady state on either side. You know, startups can be just start on the blockchain side, for example. How do you think about successfully moving over and like not, you know, creating redundancies, I guess, and, and moving it over in a way that you seek, I guess, sequence correctly? Yeah, and are you, Alex, are you just, just to be clear, are you talking about like blockchain or are you just generally speaking like the cloud or like, you know, are there specific elements of your question? I think uh, let's keep it to blockchain specific. Yeah, blockchain. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, I, I, so um, that and that's that's kind of the rub. So you you got a great question, just because like let let me give you an example, right? So there are assets um, that are that are secure. So say for example, the assets that are born onto the blockchain, right? Versus assets that sit out there that um, that are not on the blockchain. And um, and it's really hard to actually recreate that representation onto the onto the blockchain from a legal perspective, um, and so so that that really is a challenge, and and so let me just talk about an investment that we made in a company called Symbiont, and their goal is actually to you know at birth um, the the security and just you know call it a loan or whatever you want to call it, but it can be in uh, you know an equity. Um, a slice of a company that is actually a digitized asset that has legal representation and is and is um, recognized by the state of Delaware to sit on the blockchain, right? And so, and you could imagine a startup that issues equity, and that startup is, you know, it, it and all everything is a digitized asset on the blockchain, um, and you have equity in that. And as that startup continues to grow and grow and grow, maybe it eventually it IPOs, right? And again, everything's still on the blockchain. And then you can imagine a world where maybe those, uh, you know, blockchain based digitized securities are then trading on a secondary platform right in the future. Um, that's kind of the holy grail. Um, and I think that's that's really where you want to get to, which is and then and then, by the way, if you think about that, there's a whole series of corporate actions that are associated with that asset. So, you know, dividend payments or, uh, you know, proxy voting or a whole bunch of different things that, that occur when you own a slice of Apple, there's actually a lot of stuff that happens in the background that you don't really think about um, because you just kind of expect it. But the reality is it's a lot of work and effort to make sure that you get your dividend or it's a lot of work and effort to make sure that you get the notifications around proxy. So, um, and so if there's a world where now everything is on the blockchain, you know, all the registrants, all the people who own the security, it's, um, and all the people who are entitled to various corporate actions, now it's all digitized and it's instantaneous. That's a completely different world, right? So um, I think that there there is a model to get to that future world at some point. I think that we're a bit far off, but it is exciting. I, it's definitely really exciting. Very cool. And yeah, I think there's kind of a uh, sort of what you were saying about startups versus uh, incumbents that. It's funny because like the startups have all the new tech, but the incumbents have all the assets and things to apply it to. So for example, I, I know there's a lot of companies issuing new blockchain securities, regulated products, but there's not a huge market to buy like a brand new startup as a blockchain security in it, but there are billions of dollars of real estate sitting in a legacy system that could maybe be converted over to a digital asset and then chopped and sliced and diced and traded in, in different kind of ways than it ever has been possible. Um, and where those two meet and where that kind of efficiencies meet, uh, I guess we'll see, or that's kind of the, where the grind is on it all. And, and by the way, I 100% agree. And you know, it doesn't actually have to be, be blo uh, on blockchain, by the way. I just, there is an element of just digitizing all those like mortgage loans that exist out there, or there's a, there's a ton, like corporate loans, there's, a, there's tons of asset classes that just need to be digitized, period like irrespective of whether it's on blockchain or not. Um, but I do think that blockchain as a technology can be one methodology to, to really make sure that they're digitized. I wonder also, do you think that most of the transformation is more a psychological social one or is it more of a technical one? I would say, um, I really think it's risk-based and bear with me for one second as I explain that. 
the people who are managing like the back office and middle office of a lot of these big financial services companies, like, you know, whether you're on the buy side or the sell side, whatnot, um, you know, I think there's just risk, right? And if you are going to change the system and try to make it more efficient, you better well, like be damn sure that you feel confident that it's going to work. Because if you're going to screw it up um, by, by making it like, you know, incrementally more efficient, but it's going to create a ton more risk on the back end, it's not worth it, right? So I, I think, you know, more than anything, um, you know, people operate on on the fear, on the fear, for lack of a better word, and and I, I of uh, of screwing things up versus the opportunity and excitement of making things better and making things more efficient. So how do you? So to answer your question, I think you you have that, and that's why you're seeing sort of a sprinkling of small little things here and there happening. You kind of get to your psychological point of okay, a lot of people are comfortable that there's real scale here, and then you make that quantum leap. And I think once you get enough people that are kind of hanging around, I do think that a quantum leap happens. But um, and I think that quantum leap is actually pretty psychological. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess, you know, on the finance or like investment side, also like nobody loses their job for doing the thing that's always been done. But try, you know, you buy Bitcoin and the thing falls 50 percent overnight. Suddenly, you know, your pension fund is asking why they're paying you money to manage the money. Uh, and so. You know, I think we see at least on the investment side, you start seeing institutional cover with, you know, SkyBridge or Tesla, MicroStrategy, Stanley Druckenmiller, you know, all these people are going, yeah, like I'm involved. And then, you know, regular financial manager could say, well, you know, Stanley Druckenmiller thought it was a good idea. So, I, you know, I'm not the only like idiot if it, if it goes down. And I imagine huh. that's still on the, I think on the tech side though, you know, there's also this need for a critical mass, just like email. If there was only two people using email, it doesn't matter if it works perfectly, it's not that useful. And so I imagine on the, you know, moving capital via a blockchain or digital digitized version even, uh, you just need scale of participants before it really has a value add as well. No, Alex, you're hundred percent right. And that's when I talked about Broadridge, I'll give my like five, five second Broadridge commercial, but, um, and that's why, you know, if, if we're in the center of all that and we are at the center of the network, and we can actually help effectuate some of this change around blockchain because we are the infrastructure provider for the industry. That's a good way, you know, for, you know, if you're a big, again, like if you're a Morgan Stanley or a JP Morgan, um, you know, you can rely on a brokerage to help you do that versus having to take the risk yourself, right? And so easier to blame um, Broadridge than to blame, uh, you know, the the person in your in your office. And um, and so that's that's kind of the the, the thought there. I wonder also, you know, one thing that, for example, I've worked on consulting on like supply chain blockchain products, and you can design this perfect system where every participant in the supply chain can see everybody else and directly share information and then to hand off things and there's complete transparency. Uh, the same there have been like pilots to the UN to show like funds being moved to developing countries to show that the funds go to where they're supposed to. And what you encounter though is that when you move off paper into the real world, there's benefit to the incumbents to not have transparency and not share all their information. That's their edge or asymmetry. And so I wonder if you imagine or have encountered any, like I'm just imagining you could aggregate JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, all these groups and say, hey, share information. And maybe they're not so jazzed about sharing everything they know. Yeah, uh, listen, I, I, I think that there's, there's some validity of that. Um, and, and certainly, um, getting different market participants to share is basically impossible. Um, um, getting someone in the middle who's a third party who can help you with that um, is easier, but still difficult, right? Um, and and so, um, and I, I totally hear you on the supply chain thing, which again, I think there's real, there's real promise there. It's again, it's like, you know, do the rewards um, and hopefully the rewards are short-term versus long-term, but do the short-term rewards um, will they will they make enough of a difference to compensate for the huge investment that you're going to make, especially if it's infrastructural? Um, that's that's just that's a big risk, right? And so people's jobs are on the line. Like, do they want to do that? Um, and you know, someone like Elon Musk can can take gambles, but a lot of people can't, right? So so that's um, that's that's really the rub, which is you know how and it's, it's certainly in this day and age with you know post COVID where um, I think innovation budgets really have shrunk quite a bit. And so there's much more of a focus on 
um, you know, what, what return can I get as soon as possible on some of these investments? This is an interesting question, like basically kind of where you're at in the market and how you perceive risk. So for maybe startups, the risk is I, I have all these big companies that are going to steal my lunch. And so I have to be more innovative and maybe for the incumbents, you know, trying something new is risk. But, you know, if, for example, I guess the way we see it is like, you know, Bitcoin is going to be around for a while and there's risk and not getting like ahead of it. And the same, you know, if everything's moving over to blockchain, there's a risk to not moving at least in pace with, with everybody else. And um, yeah, just kind of, you know, there's a risk of like being too far ahead and there's a risk of being too far behind. Um, but I think when you have something to lose, you usually think about it from the perspective of what you have to lose, not what you have to gain. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a fair thing. And I obviously, I think a lot of, lot of eyes are watching like, you know, where we are on the adoption curve, right? And so, and I, I completely agree with you. You don't want to be, like the the last you know the last person of the party it's it's definitely risky to be the first one and so you know i think if you're kind of like the fast follower where you're like not at the front of the line but you're kind of still early enough to to be early, you know to to get a lot of the uh, the benefits um from some of the investments um without being too late i think that's probably the the sweet spot there you know, it makes me think also when you're talking about kind of finding short term wins that justify the investment or the risk Kind of reminds me of like the evolution of like an ear or a wing or something where like you didn't just have like an eyeball or a wing day one. You had must have had some other reason to have it that was shorter term that was kind of the first move into it. And then it becomes this fuller, more complex thing. But, uh, you know, day one, it has to have some benefit as well. Yeah, I mean, listen, I mean, the analogy I like to give is I have this heater at my house. It was built in like 1960 it's a freaking tank. Like it is just amazing. It's never going to break because it's made of materials that it was made from that they don't make them anymore. And, but it's also really expensive and it's really inefficient and it's not good for the environment. Right. So, um, you know, every year I'm like, oh, maybe I should do geothermal. It's a huge capital investment, but man, it's going to be so much cheaper and it's better for the environment. And every year that goes by. So it, listen, it's like, but you know, the cost of geothermal is also going down as well as the technology changes, right? So I think there's a similar analogy there with crypto, with B2B, um, you know, blockchain, which is the technology and adoption as it gets greater and greater, the cost goes down, the marginal cost goes down and, and the risk goes down. And that means the ROI also can be greater. So like you're kind of doing the math of all these various things. And, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Absolutely. But on the other hand, as, as trends continue to change, um, you know, at there's some point you hit the, you hit that tipping point. The last question I'll, I'll pose to you is, are there other things that Broadridge is using blockchain for or sees kind of on the near to, to midterm that uh, you can share or that, that is exciting to you? Yeah, I, you know, I, I did talk about that, that one example. Um, and, you know, here, here's another one. Um, that that I think I think is relevant. Again, it's it's a bit wonky and it's it's very specific, but I'll just put it out there. Um, we might have some buy side folks, um, you know, who who would be interested in this, which is so private equity administration. So if you are an LP, if you're an investor in a private equity fund, um, you know, first of all, like you know, you'll make the investment. It'll sit there. You know, you're entitled to um, you know tax documents. You might get a capital call. There are you know, various things that happen, um, but it's a highly manual process. Maybe you'll get an email, um, maybe you won't. Uh, you know, the tax documents, all these things that happen, um, it's very manual, it's really cumbersome, and there's no really centralized way to get that. So now let's put that on the blockchain. Let's put everything on the blockchain and say, okay, now your, your LP investment now sits in the blockchain. Now we know all the people at an instant, right? We know everybody who is, um, you know, who is an investor, if we need to send out some documents or we have to do a capital call, we know instantaneously who we need to go out to. And it's a much more seamless, um, seamless process. So we are, we have created a blockchain uh, based product that actually puts all of that um, onto, onto a distributed ledger. And um, it's created a ton of efficiency in the system. We're getting a ton of uptake on the buy side. And uh, it's really exciting. Like, you know, we're, and I think that the takeaway here is you know, I said we're sprinkling a bunch of things um, around the market, but we're, now we're starting to make money for it, right? And so we're making money on our investments um, and, and we're making money for the GPs, right? For the people that run these private equity funds too, right? Now, like there was a ton of costs that they were that they were spending 
and now it's it's much easier. And to your point before, like you know, especially if you're a startup, um, you sort of an earlier stage LP where it's just much easier to adopt something new versus like using something that always existed. Um, and so that's where we're getting some uptake as well. But regardless, I think in the private equity space, um, we think that there's real opportunity as well for for institutional blockchain. Awesome. Well, thanks, Mike. I'm going to take a couple minutes now and talk through more on the digital assets side, and then we'll return with Carly and Mike in a couple of minutes for, for some questions from the uh, viewers of the webinar. Great. So what I have to say is that digital assets, Bitcoin and Ethereum are, are the focus of our fund, are growing and here to stay. Um, this is just in 2020 and early this year, uh, just a smattering of some of the institutional events that have occurred. We've seen major investment fund managers from uh, Anthony Scaramucci and Skybridge, Paul Tudor Jones, Stanley Druckenmiller all start to say that they have an interest in Bitcoin. Guggenheim Partners as well has bought uh, an interest in, in Bitcoin. Uh, the Grayscale Bitcoin Investment Trust is uh, somewhere over $30 billion now, almost a, I think about a 10x growth in, in just over one year. That's both a coupling of uh, new investment and a growth in the value of the asset. Uh, we've also seen the CME group introduce Bitcoin options, which is particularly interesting to us, you know, just the beginning of 2020. So, you know, the options market only got started a couple, couple months back, really, a little over a year ago. Um, and I'll show another slide in a minute, but we've seen an incredible amount of growth in the volume of options interest. We've also seen this big trend of uh, institutions starting to put Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Uh, Square announced a $50 million buy in October of last year. They just announced another one yesterday of $170 million. We saw Tesla buy $1.5 billion of Bitcoin and announced that earlier this month. Uh, MicroStrategy also, where, where Mike comes from, has bought several billion dollars of, of Bitcoin in the last couple months. And I can tell you from being on the other side of it and talking to the clients that we have that there is a wave of, of other groups, both private and public companies that are starting to enter the fray as well. Um, we've also seen investment funds uh, like Mass Mutual, a boring old insurance company, add Bitcoin $100 million, you know, which for Mass Mutual is just a, a toe in the water as a big financial firm. But uh, you know, from a, a very risk adverse conservative insurance company, I think they're about 170 years old, uh, buy Bitcoin as well, which again, like we were discussing with Mike, just gives cover to regular asset managers and regular companies to start taking a look at this and putting some pressure on them to, to keep a pace as well. The other thing I can tell you is that, you know, from direct experience that there are also uh, sovereign countries that are looking at buying Bitcoin or buying digital assets as well uh, as a, another reserve uh, against gold, for example. I think especially the countries that I, in the developing world that don't have giant Ford Knoxes full of gold, uh, the ability to maybe get in on the next gold earlier and secure their country's financial future is of high interest as well. Um, so amidst all of this background, we've seen a, over 40% of all the US dollars ever created printed in just the last year. And all that money needs to go somewhere. We haven't seen massive inflation on a you know, regular day-to-day -day buying perspective, but if you look at the rise in stocks and the rise in the cost of Bitcoin, other things, it's sort of like institutional inflation in the sense that everything costs more for the same dollar. Um, and there's no end in sight of that, really. The Fed continues to announce more printing and more uh, buybacks of, of bonds and things like that to, to shore up the economy. So um, there's a lot going on in this space. I think we'll see over the next three, six months, even more uh, corporations and institutions announce major purchases of Bitcoin and digital assets, and uh, as well as more regulatory oversight and adoption of Bitcoin as, as something that's here to stay. Uh, this is just to show as of today, kind of where we're at in you know, what we follow closely to manage risk, which is the stock to flow model. Uh, stock to flow looks at the amount of existing supply of something divided by its annual production rate. Uh, this is used for a lot of scarce resources like gold or real estate, diamonds, platinum, and often add, offers a pretty useful way to measure the price of something and where it's gonna go in the market. What's unique about Bitcoin in particular is that its new supply is cut in half every 
roughly four years every 210,000 blocks. And we tend to see that the first 16 months or first third of the cycle after the cut in supply is when you see these exponential moves up in price. Uh, and as you can, this kind of rainbow color looks at how long until the next cut in supply. And it tends to be when you're moving into the orange, yellow, uh, and yellow phases that there's these logarithmic moves. If you look at the scale, this is a logarithmic scale. So every uh, horizontal line is a 10x move up. And you know it's kind of eerily similar to the last few cycles, but we're following, again, a move up in the price that puts us today somewhere around 50,000, 51,000. Um, and if it, the charts hold, uh, has much more to go. This is, and I guess what is important to talk about here is, you know, when you're looking at a hundred thousand dollar Bitcoin or anything above that, that's really, you know, you're talking in the trillions of dollars of Bitcoin. It just hit over a trillion in market cap the other day, which again adds for institutions an ability for them to add it to their balance sheet, add it as an investment thing. It's not some kind of tiny niche thing once it's you know over a trillion dollars. And um, at two prime, we expect this to to continue on at least for uh, the next next foreseeable future in this cycle. Uh, this is just to show similarly the model and how it's compared to previous cycles. This has been drawn to scale. So, you know, the blue line was in 2012 in the previous cut in supply and the, the light blue and the dark blue is the most recent cut in supply in 2016 and the red is where we're trending here. It's kind of moving somewhere in a similar middle trajectory between the two. What we've seen also that is not evident here is that the standard deviation moves of these pulls up are shrinking in size, which tends to speak to a mature, more mature market as derivatives traders and others traders are pulling out volatility on the ride up. And so what you see is less deviation in terms of pullbacks and moves up before you see corrections, which uh, means that there's a little bit less risk and a little less um, excitement as well, but there's plenty, plenty still to go around. And um, just speaks to a flattening and a smoothing and de-risking of, of the market as a whole. Uh, this is just to show you the, the derivatives market, which again, for us is a pretty big indicator of institutional participation since options trading tends to be a more sophisticated strategy around managing risk. Um, what you see a lot is that people actually buy private grayscale shares and then sell them on the secondary market when they're unlocked. And a major use of options was to protect that position during that locked up period. Uh, it gets a bit wonky, but um, that was a major kind of early use of options. And we're seeing that both the style of option purchases as well as the volume grow dramatically in just a couple last months. In 2020, there was an 1800% growth in Bitcoin options volume. And just in from December to January, almost a 50% growth. Uh, we expect that to only continue and for groups like us that use options to manage risk uh, means that there's better spreads on options trading, uh, more participants and just a more lively and healthy market in general, greater liquidity. Uh, this is just the same. So it's not you know exclusive to Bitcoin. We see here also Ethereum options. Again, these things have only been around a little over a year but there's major growth in volume. Uh, you can see on this chart, Deribit is kind of the number one incumbent or dominant uh, market share at this point with the CME uh, and, and US kind of regulated options exchanges being far behind. Uh, but again, this speaks to also the health of ETH uh, in these markets as well as a um, high interest uh, options market with more sophisticated actors entering the fray. Um, this is just quickly about our fund. We only hold Bitcoin and Ethereum. We lend out a lot of that portfolio uh, to earn extra yield and then we're basically using options to manage risk. So we're willing to give up a little bit of the upside uh, while protecting a lot of the downside so that I can sleep at night or I joke we want to try to make crypto a little bit boring. Um, and it's definitely not boring, but uh, at least have some risk parameters around the way that we manage uh, the funds for ourselves and our clients. So that's kind of the digital assets market. So with that, um, here's ways to get in touch with uh, each of the respective speakers. Um, you can check out Carly's art also on her website, carlychakenart.com. Uh, and then here's our Twitter information as well. Uh, so with the last 10 minutes, I'm gonna stop the share and uh, turn it over to the questions that we have. Um, 
So I am going to say, well, there was one question I had last night actually that came from an email I got in advance and was saying, how do you make, how do you live off of Bitcoin instead of just using it as an investment asset? And I think the shorter answer is I wouldn't like put your whole life savings and living in, in stock with Bitcoin. Um, but you know, one of the major ways, depending on how much capital you have is to lend it out. And in doing so you can earn interest. So there's groups for retail like BlockFi that offer pretty decent interest rates of 6% or so on just holding Bitcoin with them. And then there's, you know, we lend out to more sophisticated um, other hedge funds and other groups that offer higher rates. Um, and you can earn you know, higher interest rates than that. And that's something we offer to our clients as well, but you, you can live off the interest if you have enough money. Um, other than that, I would say it's a high, pretty high risk strategy. Um, so now I have one I'm gonna turn over to Mike, which is because you have experience with the Fed, how do you think a central bank digital currency will either facilitate or prevent the adoption of blockchain technology? Sure, I would say that um, I think we're, there's a lot of trepidation, just generally speaking, um, just because it's a government and the government is always going to take their time. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, the new um, supposed nominee, the nominee for the SEC is a guy named Gary Gensler, who um, used to teach at MIT and is pretty big in cryptocurrency. And so I think he's going to, he's going to take, take this on and start um, you know, start really focusing on, on ways in which um, you could really, uh, we as a system um, and a global system can can take advantage of this. So I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. Obviously, he's going to be very busy with GameStop and Robinhood and all the things that have happened over the past, you know, month or so. And I know there's, uh, and it looks like Robin uh, GameStop had another uh, little bump yesterday. So I, I think that's going to be his, his first area of focus. But I, I do think that from a regulatory standpoint, you're going to see greater focus, um, greater interest, um, certainly from the US, but but definitely from the world. Awesome. Yeah. We got one for Carly, which I think I hopefully uh, you'll know the answer to is it says, what does Sam think about Bitcoin? And where did the idea for eCoin come from? Um, I wish <laughs> I knew. I'm sure Sam, who's our creator, a Miss Robot, I'm sure he has a lot of Bitcoin, um, but I think he is was just very innovative. So much of the stuff in our show did come true. So I think in you know 2014 when he wrote this, he knew that cryptocurrency was going to be the future and what everybody was going to be going to. So I think that just that idea is where it came from. Okay. Um, Can I ask a question? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay, to you guys, how much do you think, like I know we've seen, and you might have said this, and you're very smart, and obviously I couldn't, I couldn't follow all of it, but how much do you think Bitcoin is going to drop in like the next big dip? So at, at our fund, we, uh, we're, we more don't try to make predictions, but more just manage risk. But I would say that historically in the last bull cycles, what you've seen from the very highest price is about an 80 to 85% drop. Uh, and then that cycle starts over. So I think that my personal belief, which we don't use for day-to-day -day trading, thank God, is um, that because there's more institutional participants and more of this like derivatives market that it, you may see a dampening of that. And maybe it's only a 60% drop this time, um, but that tends to be historically around 85% of the, the peak price. And um, yeah, I bet you we're going to find out in about six to nine months from now. So uh, we can check back in. Um, and I, yeah, so that's my thought. Um, another one I have for Mike here is it says a few years ago, financial markets went from five day settlement for trades to three day settlement for trades. How do you see the middle and back office infrastructure? incorporating blockchain to enable real-time settlement? Uh, it's, it's, a really, it's a really good question, particularly given um, the unprecedented, unprecedented trade volume and volatility that we, we've seen over the, the, the past couple of weeks. And obviously, I think the very natural question is, you know, can settling trades in real time on the blockchain solve for this? Um, you know, what I'd say is that to get um, to, from T plus five to most recently, we're actually T plus two, 
uh, it took years to push through the last big adjustment of the process. Um, and, and the last one was in 2017 when they went from, um, from there, there are two, they moved from three to two. So, um, and, and I, I think, you know, even a modest acceleration of this settlement process right now, it'd be a huge heavy lift um, in, involving regulators, banks, brokerages, financial service providers, that everybody would have to update their systems in order to make this happen. And, uh, and so, you know, obviously what's the next one is T plus one. Um, you know, I'd already talked about um, uh, blockchain and just the challenges of getting there in the near term, but, you know, getting from T plus one and then to T plus zero, um, listen, I think it's, it's feasible or real, but it's gonna be really challenging um, just because lots of, you know, there's a lot of complexity around costs there's the end-to-end -end process of redesign and substantial technology investment enhancements you've got to make to get that real-time processing. Um, and then, you know, for example, like changes we need to make, uh, enable to make like real-time notifications for SEC lending. Um, you know, you have to facilitate the funding of cross-border trades and all of these things have like market practices. So to get to something less than T plus, T plus two right now, it can happen. It's just, it just will require a ton of work and energy. Gotcha. Yeah. Last quick question I'm gonna answer that we have from a few people is basically, do you see uh, institutions and corporates investing in only Bitcoin or are they investing in Ethereum as well? Um, I think definitely what we've seen is Bitcoin's the dominant kind of one just because of its size and history, but we do see, I you know, Bitcoin base put out their public IPO information. And they do hold ETH themselves for, they're a corporate treasury, obviously they're a crypto company. And I can tell you that we have clients that are corporate treasuries that through our fund have exposure to Bitcoin and Ethereum. I think for us, you know, especially if you can manage it with options, Ethereum actually maybe has more of the upside. If you know Bitcoin's kind of the gateway drug, the next thing you're gonna try is Ethereum. And so I think it's a little bit ahead of where most institutions are now, but as you see the CME bringing derivatives for Ethereum and, and kind of, awareness of it grows and then the tech itself scales, you'll see uh, more Ethereum on balance sheets, but there's already some I can tell you directly from the clients that we have. So with that, I really appreciate you both, Mike and Carly. This was super interesting and I think really far ends of the spectrum on, on where we're looking at crypto from. And I, I really appreciate it. So thanks everybody for joining. Uh, we'll have this recording on YouTube to, to view again and uh, hope you both have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks Alex, thanks Carly.